you were told the Middle Ages were dirty, brutal, primitive, that peasants froze through winter, ate scraps, died young. But the truth is colder than that, because while today you rely on thermostats, filters, and backup power, they had none of it. No steel, no circuits, no second chances, and yet they survived, not by luck, but by skill, by turning soil into stoves, grease into shelter, and sheep into heaters. They didn't Google solutions, they remembered them, and they passed them on. Through stories, through scars, through survival, this isn't a history lesson, it's a reckoning. Because when systems fail, it won't be your gadgets that save you. It'll be what you've stored in your head. And today, you're going to remember seven ancient techniques that may one day stand between you. And the freeze that ends everything. Technique 1. Grease-treated cloaks. You're miles from the nearest village. The wind bites. The ground sucks heat like a leech. You have no tent, no firewood, just a thick wool cloak smelling of smoke sweat and something else, grease. Medieval shepherds knew warmth isn't a luxury, it's a defense, so they turned to the one thing every slaughtered animal left behind, fat. Rendered into tallow or lard, it wasn't just fuel, it was survival armor. They rubbed it into their cloaks, thick, heavy, water repellent. The result, a windproof, semi-waterproof barrier that retained body heat even when damp. In modern terms, it was a homemade bivy sack. But unlike synthetic gear, it could be eaten, because survival meant turning your coat into calories when nothing else remained. Some herders took it further, mixing fat with ash or bark powder to seal fibers. Grease didn't just trap warmth. It resisted freezing rain, blocked wind shear, slowed evaporative heat loss. Compare that to now. You've got Gore-Tex waterproof zippers, thermal lining. But what happens when it rips, when it melts near fire, when it fails in real cold? This cloak didn't fail. It dried slow. It stank. But it worked. Even armies later adopted the principle. Waxed canvas, oiled wool, fat-lined boots. Not for comfort, for survival. You don't need a perfect jacket. You need something that keeps heat in and death out. And in the medieval world, grease was worth more than gold, because gold can't keep you warm at night. Technique 2. Earth ovens. The fire was buried. So was the food. So was the danger. In a medieval winter flame meant life, but sometimes it also meant visibility to enemies, to raiders, to anyone watching for smoke. So people learned to cook underground, quiet, slow, invisible. The earth oven was brutally simple. Dig a pit, line it with stones, build a fire inside, let it burn until the rocks glowed red. Then, clear the coals. Wrap your food in leaves, bark, or clay, and bury it. You didn't just cook. You turned the ground into a slow-burning hearth. Silent, hidden, deadly effective. It roasted meat, softened roots, baked flatbreads, all without giving away your position. Modern campers still use it. But few understand the full brilliance, because this wasn't just about calories. It was about time. You could leave the food for hours, go gather wood, haul water, stand watch. And when you returned, the steam would rise as you dug back into the earth. Hot, moist, ready. In village life, earth ovens became gathering points. Feast pits, shared meals, shared stories. Fuel was precious. So was heat. One fire could feed many if you knew how to trap it. Compare that to today. Press a button. Heat your meal. Eat alone. But when the power goes out, what's your backup plan? They didn't have electricity. They had stones. They had patience. And they knew. If you can trap heat in the ground, you can keep hunger out of your home. Sometimes survival starts with a hole in the earth and the memory of how to use it. Technique 3. Herbal First Aid. There were no hospitals, no antibiotics, no pharmacists at the village edge, just a wound, a fever, a cough, 
and a patch of weeds growing by the path. In the medieval world, first aid didn't come in bottles. It came in leaves, roots, bark, and memory. People knew where to look. Yarrow, plucked fresh and pressed into a gash, stopped bleeding fast. Garlic, crushed into paste or steeped in wine, fought infection before it spread. Comfrey, called bone knit, was mashed into poultices to reduce swelling and heal bruises. Plantain, just a roadside weed, pulled out stingers, soothed burns, calmed bites, and nettle. Nettle was food. Nettle was tea. Nettle was medicine. It cleansed the blood, strengthened joints, fought fatigue. None of this was superstition. It was trial, error, generations of watching what worked and what didn't. Today, we talk about natural remedies. Back then, they were the only option. And while modern science has synthetic pills, many of those pills come from these same plants. Aspirin from willow bark, penicillin, they didn't name it, but they used moldy bread that did the job. Morphine from poppies, they already harvested, but what made the system powerful wasn't just the herbs, it was the memory network. Knowledge passed from hands to hands, from mothers to daughters, from healers to apprentices. No internet, no manuals, just time, dirt, and trust. They didn't need a doctor's appointment. They needed a sharp eye and the courage to try. Modern preppers talk about trauma kits, EDCs, emergency meds. But what happens when the kit runs out? When the grid's down and the pharmacy's locked, then it comes back to this, knowing which leaf to chew, which root to boil, which weed might save your life. Medieval medicine wasn't primitive. It was observant, adaptive, and in the right hands. Still deadly effective. When everything else fails, it's not what you own that matters. It's what you remember growing under your feet. Technique 4. Body Heat Nesting it was too cold to sleep, too cold to think, too cold to be alone. And that's when the shepherd crawled between two sheep, not for comfort, but for survival. In the highlands on wind-scoured hills, medieval herders faced nights that could kill. No tents, no fires, just wool instinct and body heat. So they used the oldest heat source known to man each other, sheep on both sides, a lamb or dog curled against the chest, wool cords tied around everyone to keep the huddle tight. It wasn't elegant. It wasn't clean. But it worked. This was body heat nesting, a human, animal cocoon, your breath, their breath, circulating, rising, trapping. Even armies knew the trick. During winter campaigns, soldiers slept in pairs, rotated positions, wrapped cloaks around one another to conserve warmth. Military orders even demanded it. No man sleeps alone. Today, survivalists call it co-sheltering, double bagging, shared thermal mass. It's still taught in polar training and military survival schools. Because the physics hasn't changed, your body loses heat to air but pressed against fur flesh or fabric that heat stays close. Modern gear tries to mimic this foil blankets, insulated bags, but even the best sleeping bag can't match the warmth of another beating heart beside you. It's easy to forget that survival is not a solo sport, that the person next to you might be the difference between morning and never waking up. The shepherds knew. The soldiers knew. The peasants in smoke-stained cottages knew. They didn't sleep for comfort. They slept to live. Together. And when your fingers go numb, your firewood's wet, and the storm won't pass, you'll remember what they did. You'll crawl closer, wrap tighter, and rediscover what they never forgot. Sometimes the warmest fire is the one already burning inside the bodies beside you. Technique 5. Sand and charcoal filter. The stream looked clear, but clarity means nothing. Invisible threats float beneath the surface. Bacteria rot decay. And yet, medieval people drank, lived, survived. 
Because they didn't trust water, they filtered it. No pumps, no tablets, just layers. Cloth, sand, charcoal. Water was poured through linen to catch the obvious leaves, mud insect wings. Then came the sand, coarse, then fine, slowing the flow, removing sediment, then charcoal. Burned wood crushed into black powder. It absorbed odor, neutralized toxins, even trapped microscopic life. It wasn't perfect, but it was safe enough. Safe enough to avoid fever. Safe enough to stay alive. The filters weren't fancy. Sometimes just a hollow log. Sometimes a jar packed tight. Sometimes a wooden trough carved by hand. But they worked powered by gravity, not gear. Rainwater was caught from rooftops, stored in clay barrels sealed with pitch, some even steep thyme or ash in water. Early forms of disinfection. This wasn't primitive science. It was engineered from observation, refined through cold sickness and need. Modern aid groups still use the same principle. Sand and charcoal, filters in disaster zones, refugee camps, off-grid villages. Because when all else fails, these materials don't. Your high-tech purifier might clog, its battery might die, but cloth, sand, wood, and fire, they're everywhere. They don't need instructions, they just need someone who remembers. And the next time you kneel at a murky stream, ask yourself, would you drink? Or would you know how to turn dirt and ash into a second chance? Because they did. And it kept them alive. Technique 6. Signal fires. There were no phones, no radios, no emergency hotline, just distance. And the threat closing in. So medieval people lit fires, not for heat, not for cooking, but for warning. Signal fires. A single flame high on a hill could mean one thing danger. In wartime, they were placed in sequence, one hill to the next, each fire seen by the next outpost, a chain of light stretching across miles. It wasn't instant, but it was fast enough to save lives. One fire might mean invaders. Two could signal an army, smoke in short bursts or long columns. Each combination carried a code. This was medieval communication, simple, brilliant, reliable. Even today, the method works. Build a fire in an open area, feed it dry grass, twigs bark, let it burn hot, then throw on green leaves or wet moss. The result, thick white smoke, visible for miles. Modern survival manuals still teach this because satellites can fail, phones lose signal, but firefighter never loses signal, and not just in war. Shepherds used smoke to call neighbors. Villagers signaled for help. Even seasonal gatherings were summoned by fire. In a world terrified of being disconnected, our ancestors were never truly out of reach. As long as they had dry tinder and sky. So ask yourself if the power cuts tonight, if the tower goes down. Do you remember how to be seen, how to call for help without saying a word they did? And sometimes a plume of smoke on the horizon wasn't just fire. It was the voice of survival. Technique 7. Tallow lamps. When the sun vanished and the cold crept in, they didn't flip a switch. They didn't strike a match. They reached for fat. Because fat meant fire. Medieval peasants didn't waste what they killed. Bones became tools, skins became shelter, and fat became light, tallow, rendered from pig sheep or cattle, boiled, strained, stored, a thick greasy paste that could do it all, dip a wick, twisted linen, a dried reed into tallow, and you had a lamp. Not pretty, not fragrant, but it burned, long, slow. Hot enough to warm hands, light a corner, or cook a small meal. In homes with no windows, no fireplaces, this glow meant the difference between night and nothing. But tallow did more than burn. It sealed leather, softened cracked skin, waterproofed boots, lubricated tools, and in the worst moments, fed the starving. Because yes, tallow could be eaten. 
A spoonful of fat could carry a man through another day of frost and labor. Today, we rely on batteries, solar panels, propane canisters. But when those run out, what will you reach for? Tallow doesn't expire quickly. It doesn't shatter when dropped. It doesn't fail when wet. It only needs flame and the hands of someone who remembers. Modern preppers are rediscovering it. Off-grid builders use it. History kept it alive for a reason. Because in the darkness when there's nothing left, one jar of animal fat is light, is warmth, is life. When all else fails, what do you remember? You've just walked through seven medieval survival techniques. None of them used wires. None required batteries. None depended on modern supply chains. Just wool, stone, fire, grease, and memory. Because our ancestors didn't survive by luck. They survived by knowing. Knowing how to stay warm with a cloak soaked in fat. How to cook a meal underground. How to treat a wound with weeds. How to call for help with smoke. How to light the dark with what the butcher left behind. We like to think we've evolved, but when the lights go out, when the screen goes black, what you own won't save you. What you remember might. Survival doesn't start with gear. It starts with observation, with humility, with learning what the earth has always offered. So ask yourself, if the modern world blinked out tonight, could you light your own path? Drop a comment below. Which of these ancient tricks would you try first? And don't forget to subscribe, because the old ways aren't dead. They're just waiting to be remembered.